That's really important. I know of no truths that I can share that are of such significance. You hear me say, I'm thinking about teaching these things in these other countries. I'm loaded with sermons. I'm full. I can't open my mouth. I'm full. I want to preach all directions. I have a hard time. I make these notes to keep me from telling all these stories and getting carried away and preaching. I want to preach. Oh, so much is so true. But, but if I've written something, then, then I can give them a book. But I haven't written this. When I get through another year or two, I'm, I'm going to write this in a book and put it in a manual and, and give it to the world. But today, we're talking about this Christ connection. These four verses that form the bridge from his ministry to our ministry. It, it, as I said last night, it links the history of God visiting the world in one believer with the reality of God visiting the world in all believers. God's still visiting the world. That's what he's doing. Hey, he can't come in spirit. We've got something he don't have that he needs. Look at me. This isn't part of the lesson. This is extra. If God came in the spirit, everybody would run. Everybody is scared of him. The record says those that saw him fell. They were, they were shocked. They faded out. They couldn't stand it. They were frightened. They were scared. He'd always tell them, don't be spooky. Don't be afraid. Don't, come on, come on, come on. I want to talk to you. He found out I couldn't do that. He can't come that way. If he came that way, the world would run. Sinners would run. Everybody would run. Everybody would be scared. God don't have what he needs. What do you think of that? Did you hear me? He needs you. He's spirit. Say God is spirit. Well, if you turn spirit loose in here, everybody's just going to get scared. To deal with this world, he needs flesh. You know, we Pentecostals always condemn our flesh. No, it's wonderful. My flesh is not bad. God made it. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon it. He poured out His Spirit upon all spirits. Quote that like that. You ever hear that? Pour out His Spirit upon all spirits. No, you get so sanctimonious when you say pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Okay, then don't condemn my flesh. It's good. God wants it. God needs it. So, He says let's make a deal. I'll give you my spirit if you'll give me your flesh and we'll have a Christian. See, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And then as a Christian, well, God can do anything. See, we don't scare people. We can talk to people. God can come and deal with people. If he has flesh. <clears throat> We're talking about the continuation of the Jesus ministry. The Holy Spirit upon them, the Holy Spirit within us. The facts of history, the acts of experience. The Christ with them, the Christ in us. Jesus of sacred history, Jesus of sacred living. Christ Jesus of yesterday, Christ Jesus of of today. Let's read these four verses in the, in the Amplified. In the former account which I prepared, O Theophilus, I made a, con I made a continuous report dealing with all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. There's principle number one, his example for us, our model. Statement, 
He showed us a new way. Next. Until the day when he ascended. Oh, I saw that was the second one. Until the day that he ascended. That's today's lesson. Until the day he ascended. That's his inspiration for us today. A day of inspiration. Or we could call it, that's our stimulus. That's our incentive. That's our catalyst. You know what a catalyst is? Wow. I think that's what it is. His, his example until the day he was taken up. After that he through the Holy Spirit had instructed and commanded the and commanded uh, I thought we better stop right there. There's a big one. You see it? After that he through the Holy Spirit had commanded by the Holy Spirit he had commanded. Now study That'll be the lesson tonight. What did he command? What is his command? How did he do it? That is our mandate. Statement for that? He regards us as his partners. So many people go out like slaves, go out like, you know, uh, They don't understand partnership with God. Tonight you will. Hallelujah. In the next session. In the next one, who did he command? The apostles whom he had chosen. Oh, tomorrow morning. Boy, that's going to be a heavy one. That's his faith in us. Statement, he depends on us. He believes in us. He's chosen us. Think about it. Ponder the importance of that. Hey, I deal with preachers all over the world. They haven't caught on to that. Next. To them he showed himself alive after his passion by a series of of many convincing demonstrations, unquestionable evidence, and infallible proofs. What's that? That's lesson number five, our credibility. His proof for us. That's important. If we don't have that, we're goners. Statement, he offers tangible proof of our witness. You believe it? He does. Next. Appearing to them during 40 days, talking to them about the things of the kingdom of God. Now this is probably the most awesome concept that I've run across in this opening summary. 40 days trying to get them to catch on to what the kingdom of God is. I pray to God that when we get through with that lesson, you will never question that again. Theologians, pontificates, have argued about that since the second century. It is simple. Forty days, you know it's a mystery to me. Forty days Jesus stayed and talked to them about the kingdom of God. Why in the world wasn't some of it written down? That's so important. In fact, I've always been kind of mad at him, and when I get to heaven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk up to him a little, say, why in the world did you use that word kingdom? That's what messed everybody up. They turned it to politics. I probably won't care when I get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
But anyway, that's our legality or his presence in us. Statement, he taught us how God can live in us. Now listen, if we go out in the ministry and we haven't gotten that straight, I don't mean as a little cliche that we confess. I mean as a living reality, God is alive in me. But I can't preach that, that's coming up later. Let's go to the next one. And while being in their company and eating at the table with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father had promised. Oh boy. Hallelujah. We think we know something about that. I believe we do know something about that. I want to keep knowing more about that, don't you? Yeah, we Pentecostal, we kind of brag. We got it all figured out. We tell the Baptists they don't know nothing. We're the smart ones. If you want to get close to God, get close to us. You know, we're the big heroes. But I want to keep learning more. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel that way. You know, I, this is big. This is big stuff. <laughs> Wait. Wait for that. And we've waited. It's time now. That was wait those 10 days. Now we don't have to wait anymore. Yeah, hallelujah for that. We know that. But let's be sure we get it. We receive him, not it, him, when he comes in. And we embrace him and get more than tongues out of the deal. See. But wait, I, that's, not, that's not our lesson today. I got to leave. <laughs> Statement. He transferred his life and ministry to us. That's back to that lap dissolve again. All that he had come over here and tapered out into us. And our little beginnings expanded and got bigger and bigger. And boy, here we come until we come to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. Isn't this, isn't this formidable? Now friends, if we, can, if we can tattoo you two with these facts, you'll go out and you'll be masters. You will do it. I said last night, if I can find some notes here that I was getting carried away with, let's see where did I write them. But I said, I said, you'll go out in his name as his representative. You'll be refreshed by a greater understanding of your own life and ministry. You'll be re-inspired to give humanity your best. Your faith will be stronger. Your hope will be brighter. Your love will be deeper. And your life will be bigger. It is true, friends. The anointing of the Holy Ghost truly came upon Luke when he wrote this summary. And why wouldn't these be great words to be weighed. And this man is writing the, our introduction. Our introduction to imitate Jesus. And in King James, it's just one sentence. So today, we focus on In that verse 2, until the day, I mean, un until the day in which he was taken up. Our inspiration, his impact on us. Those three years that he ministered, he impacted our lives. And the more we focus and read it and ponder it, the more he impacts us. You believe that? And that's why I made the statement for this lesson. We could headline it across the top there. He never gave up on us. That, that, that's the fundamental point. 
that I trust you will embrace today. He never gave up on us. Jesus came, as I mentioned last night, showing us God. Calling followers and showing them the way. Listen to this. He came showing us God, calling followers, showing them the way, teaching them that they could do it just like he did it. That they could have it just like he had it. That they could be just like he was. Now that's, that's, that's the bottom line that he came for. John 14, 12, you know. Whoever believes in me, the works that I do, shall they do also, and greater works than these shall he do. I think surely that must mean because we have electronics or something. I mean, I've preached to crowds that unless Jesus exercised a miracle power in his voice, and he didn't because he always functioned on our level. Never forget that. He functioned on our level. He never went beyond our level. He could have called 12 legions of angels. He didn't. No. He functioned on our level. So he didn't project his voice in a supernatural way. So I've preached to crowds he could not have reached. Might that be greater things than these? Could be. But I couldn't have done it either. But he knew we were going we were gonna engineer some new uh, inventions. And so uh, that makes sense to me. There may be a lot of other reasons. <clears throat> but he came showing us God. He came calling followers and showing them the way that they could do it too. If we miss that, friends, listen to me. If you miss that, look at me. You're missing everything for your ministry. You're a Jesus person. You're to go out and imitate Him. He is your catalyst. He is your stimulus. He is your motivator. He is your mentor. He's the one. That's your purpose. Don't start out in life being too humble for that. You'll mess it up and amount to nothing. Grow up. You'll have to grow up and discover for yourself, I am to go out and to represent Jesus. Oh, we say that. That's okay. I'll represent Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. It means it literally. He don't have any flesh anymore. He had flesh, but he, he gave that life and that blood for us to redeem us, to settle with Satan on our behalf, and then came back from the dead with the key ring, glory to God, and said, I fixed it now, no more problems. And hey, Pastor, I just discovered something the other day. I'll preach you a sermon, glory to God, for all of you preachers. But it thrilled me when I read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, after he purged us from our sins, he sat down. Why wouldn't he sit down? There was nothing else to do. Of course he sat down. Now, that sounds rather trite, but when you hook that up with the idea, see, if you don't see the big picture, you're going to always be grappling in darkness and mis mis mysteries and some superstitions. The big picture, God wanted to be in people. God wanted to reproduce himself. But the deal was, I'll trust you, you trust me. You understand that was the deal? That's all of us today. I'll trust you, you trust me. 
He said, good deal. We'll go for it. I fixed you the fruit and everything. The whole planet's yours. Go for it. But trust me. I love you. Yeah. And the first time Satan came in to try him out, they, they flubbed him. They did not trust what God said. God said, don't eat it. You'll die. Satan said, you won't die. They said, okay, it looks good. Let's have a bite. Daisy always said Adam wouldn't have taken it too if he hadn't been waiting on Eve to cook his dinner. I'll say that for you ladies. <laughs> I'll tell for you ladies a little bit. <laughs> you know. But see, they didn't trust him. And, and, the, and as I said last night, the whole Old Testament is given to one thing, to try to get across to human persons that you can't play with God and try to mix sin and disobedience and, and, and lack of trust with Him, it won't fly. Let's tell our world that. Let's take the Old Testament and show them that. Let's illustrate it to them. We must do that. The world, hey, we're in a promiscuous society, especially in America. It makes your hair raise. You come home from overseas. I tell the preachers, I'm going to go back to Africa where I'll be safe. You know. Come over here. You know, we, we, we feed it, and it comes off the television, and all this stuff, till we can almost have strip teasers and call it Holy Spirit. I mean, I mean, we're... we're we're, we're every day, we're deteriorating. I don't want to be a, a, throw a cloud on America, God bless America, but you know it. All the programs are talking about it. The parents are having trouble with their kids. The respect has gone to the home. Little boys and girls are running out and killing people and murdering them for the heck of it. You know, why? Oh, a great mystery. We have the greatest psychologists in the world and they're stupid. They try to make something wonderful out of it because they want to protect the TV industry and Hollywood and they don't want to say nothing bad and they're trying to chase this thing around the stump. But the whole point is, if you see murder all day, you'll murder somebody. You do what you see. No mystery about that. Our psychologists know all of that. But it's money. It's money. The stock market would go down if we stopped making those kind of films because the box offices would go down and we can't let that happen because we've got to get elected again. See, now that's not a hard luck story, but that is a problem that's mounting and all of the great thinkers are facing it and realizing it. You, you understand? But what I'm talking about is this Jesus whom we imitate. What are we? We are Jesus people. And if we don't have that perspective, when we go out there in the ministry, come on! If we're just going to go out and be, I'm a pastor. I'm an evangelist. Oh, I'm a Bible teacher. Oh, I teach in the Bible. If that's all there, no, we are Jesus people. Wherever we are, we have a model. And until the day he was taken up, wow. Everything he did, he evidently did some of everything, or he wouldn't have taken up yet. <laughs> he would have did it. He would have done it good before he quit. You can be sure that about God. He wouldn't have finished. He wouldn't have let the life of Jesus come to an end that soon if Jesus hadn't dealt with some of all of it. And I believe the Holy Spirit, and through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I believe inspired them to include enough. If we'll look at it and search at it. Just a little handful, just a few sheets. Well, I can hold enough wheat in my hand to plant a whole field. But you've got to plant it. And every grain's got to work. See, seed form isn't very big. You ever hold an acorn in your hand? Huh? Or a mustard seed? Little bitty thing. The Gospels are the seed bed. And until the day he was taken up, he's my inspiration.
<clears throat> See, when we went to India as young missionaries, we were not trained. I, I can easily imagine what we would have done in India if we'd have had this institution to attend. The Pentecostal Church of God that sent us out there, I'm sure learned, I'm sure we helped teach them that it don't pay to send people overseas who don't know anything. They may be ever so nice and bright and good looking and musical and all that good stuff, but they're going to flop out there where it gets tough if they don't know something. So they learned their lesson and I learned mine. I'm sorry they had to do it. They were good to us. They never accused us. And when we came home, instead of looking down on us, we came home in 10 months, instead of five years like we were supposed to be there, and they didn't look down on us, and we came to the first fellowship meeting, and it was like heaven, and sat on the front row, and we were scared to death, you know, afraid the superintendent and everybody would be down on us, because there we were, back a failure. But no, he was smart. He got up, and you know what he preached on? He preached on being big enough to be little and little enough to be big. Oh, what a wise man. He knew we were good stuff, but we had pulled a boo-boo. They had pulled a boo-boo too, sending us out there, untrained, so anxious to have a mission opened in India. I can understand that. Beautiful. But you just, you can never rush growth. You plant a, a, a tomato seed and you can pray your head off all around that thing, but it'll just take it so long to produce a tomato. You understand? You understand? That's really true. That's really true. Oh, I thank God for that man that he didn't, he didn't spook us, he didn't scare us, he didn't make us feel shame. Preached about Moses, you know, you know, big enough to be little, go to the desert, and then build enough to be big, lead him out. Oh boy, I never forgot that sermon. Hallelujah for people who have wisdom and people who see in people good stuff and bring out their best instead of their worst. One of his Trump lines statement through his sermon, he said it a lot of times, I'd rather be a live coward than a dead hero. He'd look down at me when he said that. <laughs> well, wasn't that, wasn't that, that was redemptive. That was redemptive for me. He redeemed us from our failure. And look what happened. Hallelujah. But the big thing, when we got back, they had voted us into a church, wonderful church, their best church in the Pacific Northwest District. And while we were there, Gordon Lindsay brought Lin uh, William Brown to, uh, to Portland. And we were hosting a Bible conference. And I was the president. But you don't just walk off. I mean, you, you have some decency. But God bless Daisy. She said, honey, we went to India and we failed. She said, we didn't have miracles says, this man down here has got miracles. We can always have a Bible conference. But that's not solving our problem. Let's go to that. I said, honey, I can't. I'm the secretary treasurer of the district. I was climbing fast in the organization. I would have been their superintendent. I preached at their camp meetings. When they needed money, I raised it. You know, if you can do that, you can climb. <laughs> Never forget that. And hey, a word to you preachers. You young preachers, learn how to raise money. If you can't get money, you don't have a ministry. 
That's a hard, harsh thing to say. But if you can't find a way to get money, you don't have a ministry because everything you try to do for God is going to cost money. So you've got to learn this great, big, beautiful concept of partnership. Which means, I know we all think of, of Oral because he's the one that started the word, and God bless Oral. He taught it, and now we, everybody uses it, the Baptists and Methodists, and even the Catholics use it, because Oral made it fly, you know. That's wonderful. But, but, but I, what I'm talking to you about is be big enough to let other people in your life and ministry with you. If you don't need their money, if you don't include them as partners, you're saying, I don't need you. I want to be the big cheese in this deal. I'm not going to share my glory with anybody. But you acted in humility. No, no, no. Uh, no, you don't have to give me money. No, no, no. That's all hypocrisy. Pure, deadly, destructive hypocrisy. Be big enough to say yes. Thank you. I need you. What I'm doing is worth every dollar you can put in this thing. Learn that. Partnership. We came back from India. We could raise the money for them. And here was this random downtown. I was hosting the conference. So I stayed, Daisy went, an old 85-year-old woman went with her. <laughs> a sweet old woman that was like a little girl in her faith. Beautiful, young in faith. And they went, and that night when we went in, I didn't have much to tell about the our conference. <laughs> it hadn't been very exciting. But Daisy, we sat up till 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. She recounted to me everything that happened every word that Brother Branham had preached, every miracle that she had seen, in tears. I was in tears. Oh, boy, that was what we wanted. I mean, we had put our lives on the line to go out and reach people. You're like that. Many of you are like that. You're going to do that. You're going to go out there. You're, you're putting your life on the line. You've got to have something, baby. I don't believe much in devils around here, but there's real devils out there. These over here are kind of synthetic, you know. People like the devils we have over here. <laughs> I've had Christians get real mad at me because I didn't. I told them they didn't have a devil, and they knew they had a devil. They wanted to have that devil. They loved that devil. They petted that devil. That devil's what gave them attention. They talked to every preacher about that devil. It gave them an audience anywhere they went, and they wanted to protect that devil. And they loved some devils because you got to have some devils. My Lord. Save us, help us grow up and get Jesus. Yeah. I'm telling you, people that's got them kind of devils, you cannot cast them out. They love them. There's one kind of devil you can't cast out. You bet your life. But when you go out there in that work, there's some real ones. There's some real ones. <clears throat> We put the real ones in asylums over here. The real ones. The others are fake. Most of them. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that alone. You might be nourishing some nice ideas that I, I'll trample on. That's not my purpose. But, 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 I, but, <laughs> <coughs> but I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, friends, I'm telling you, out there, you're going to bump into some real stuff. But what's that? Real stuff? Sure. Poor devil. Real stuff. The best he's got. Bring him close. Get him around me. Close. Get him close to me. Poor devil. Yeah. Don't go out there and think, oh, they really got the stuff. Now, I've had missionaries tell me, oh, the worst witch doctor in the country is here tonight, and he's planning to put a spell on you. I say, beautiful. Get him close to me. Let me shake hands with him. God will bless him, and his stuff will never work again. Never, never, never do that. You see, if we don't carry that attitude, we don't know some of these things I'm going to teach you this week.
what they couldn't do for us, the Pentecostal Church of God. They did all they could, and they were good to us. But Jesus did it. That's when Jesus came in our meeting. But I went to that meeting. I had seen Jesus. Jesus had appeared to me before that. Just before that. And uh, when I went to that meeting, I saw Jesus in that little man. And that really helped me. And uh, my life was changed. 10,000 voices whirled over my head saying, you can do that, you can do that. You couldn't make this other work, you can do that. You couldn't make this other work, you can do that. This other work. I won't go into what this other was. <laughs> but in, uh, just uh, noise making. I knew how to make noise. Uh, but, the, you know, we'd gang up on the devil and all yell at him. And we're all scared of him. If we got enough of us, then we were safe. But if, you know, you had to have a bunch of us. And, you know, if we thought someone was devil possessed, it, it was a frightening experience. And uh, usually, you know, you know, sometimes we'd get them, we, if we could get them to lay on their back and get a big Bible on them. That, 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 that helped. That helped. That helped. That made it a little safer, but we still kept arms linked. But if we all reached and yelled at the same time, there was a chance that something might happen. I don't, I won't, I don't know. It's hard to say that and tell the truth and not seem to be making fun of it. But anyhow, we were serious about that. We were scared of them devils. F.F. F. Bosworth told me one time, he said, he laughed, he chuckled. He said, if I was the devil, I wouldn't come out. I said, why? He said, I'd be afraid the mob would get me. <laughs> That's what he said. I didn't say that. Don't quote me. <laughs> Brother Bosworth said that. You know. So I was good at that. I could, and that's what the Lord said. You couldn't make this other work. But you can do that. That's what Peter did. That's what Paul did. That's the way Jesus did it. That proves the Bible way will work today. That was what got me. Oh, boy, that got me. Oh. So the, I was very courteous in leaving our convention. I made a nice speech, a very diplomatic speech. I'm sure that that speech had to do with our good rapport to this day. Never was a problem. I, we didn't walk off. We're holy. You guys are running a conference. We're going, no, that's silly. No, we were hungry for God. We respected them. They loved God. They were doing a good thing, running a good organization. But they weren't answering my needs. And here was a place, there was a chance that I could be helped. And so I paid the price. No price, I mean, they didn't, they, they were pleased, they were courteous, they understood. I told them, I told them very courteously in the convention, I said, we, you sent us to India. We didn't do any good. When we came home, we're embarrassed, we're ashamed. I said, we, we, we've seen those Indian people, those ancient religions, and we've got to have something. And I just feel like I've got to go down there and hear that man. They were very courteous, they understood. And so I handed over the books and everything, and the host church, and, and, and then went with Daisy. God bless Daisy. She led me into a lot of things that helped me. <clears throat> and so we went, and those voices said, you can do that, you can do that, you can do that. Oh, what a wonderful experience. That drove us to the Word of God, and we discovered all these wonderful promises in the Word of God, Jesus speaking to his followers. Now, the trouble with a lot of people, they miss a lot of that because they say he was saying that to the twelve. Well, Judas was one of them. He didn't do so hot. I guess some of us do good and some of us don't. But I include myself as one of his followers. He was saying it to his followers. He was beginning this thing. He had selected 12. He got 70. Said the same thing to them. Later, he told them, said, this is for everybody. Go tell everybody. And anyone that believes it, these miracles will take place. See? So it's unlimited. It's for everybody. But that's when it happened to me. I realized that, uh, that this is real. And so when we found those scriptures, 
I never read that. There in Luke, where he said, you know, I give unto you all power over all devils, authority over all devils, to cast them out and to cure diseases. I had read that many times. I read the Bible through ever so often. I never saw that. Heal the sick, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. I never saw that. He told them to do that. They went and they did that. There's an element, there's an area in there, I don't want to get carried away on this because I want to stick to those, but there's an area in there that gets gray. I mean, it tells you to do it, you go do it, you don't see it, and it don't work. Always. I think probably what's missing is teaching about the seed. I think that may be the missing factor. Because why is it not a problem to me if I pray for somebody and I've, uh, I've measured up, I know my heart, I've measured up and I've done my best to prepare them and I pray and I don't see the manifestation that I want. I have such total confidence. I guess I'm a farmer. I, am a far I grew up on a farm. I know seed will grow. I say seed power is the only absolute power, ultimate power, power that never changes, power that you can always depend on. Now it will depend on one thing, it will depend on the soil. You can't control the soil. And you're not supposed to go out and judge the soil. Say, no, they're a thorny soil. They're no good. I'm not going to invest it. No, we cannot do that. Any pastor knows that. We can't control the soil. But we do have the seed. The seed is good seed. The truth is good truth. We give it to people. We prepare people. That's why I don't believe in this, this promiscuous praying for people, just hopscotch and, and, and everybody. No. Unless you prepare the people. In, 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 when we started out, we, we never, we never, if I came to America today to conduct healing meetings, I wouldn't, you know what? I would give cards with numbers again. I would. I would number the cards. They would have to be in three meetings before I would pray. I think that's destroyed the faith of more people in America than any other single thing. We had the right idea. We got it from Branham and Lindsay, you know. They gave numbered cards. They had so many people. You had to give everybody a turn. But, 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 and I picked up on that, and I saw that was good. I tried it overseas, our first mass meeting, and had a, had a war. I, I hired the police. We hired the police to hand out the cards because so they was going to kill the preachers. So we hired the pre police. We had 20 policemen to, hand, to give out the card. And they are still trying to hang on to those cards. I wanted to be nice and give everybody a turn. I was still trying to touch everybody. That's a job. Try that over, overseas, you'll get killed. And, uh, and hired the police to do it. And I found out the police were charging five and ten dollars a piece for them, only to the rich people. And I saw that won't work. And that's when I gave up the cards and everything else and had to go to mass prayer. But uh, mass prayer is just as sure as individual prayer. Just as sure, and it includes everybody that's ready without giving them a number. But nevertheless, the, 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 the preparation must be done in order for people to understand. Otherwise, there's nothing, there's no faith in them to receive the seed, the soil. The seed. seed is the ultimate power. Seed is absolute power. And when you go out to minister to people, You've got to understand that. Yes, he said, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, all that. We do that. We do that. Hallelujah. You know that? I'm saying what you already know. I better get over some more stuff. But when we came back from India, something happened. When we, when we put that all together, we saw the, 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 the truth, the word, and we said, wow, 
He told us we can do this. To do this. We went on radio, newspaper, didn't have television. We, we called them. We did it. It worked. Now, God was merciful. That first night, I'm telling you, everything we touched was healed. Some of the most remarkable miracles. God looked at you, 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 you. And I, I could tell so many things that happened in those early days. How good God was. We've got to grow. We've got to grow to help more people. And so, so what I found out was, I found out it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, how much faith I had or how committed I was or how holy or how spiritual I was or, or, or learn the laws to succeed. But it was a, it was a question of uh, maybe of inspiration what we're talking about today. An inspiration. An inspiration. A, a model. A stimulus. A catalyst. I fixed on Jesus. I fixed on Jesus. And by going to the Bible, found out that that little man, I saw Jesus in that little man. He was doing what Jesus said he did. And it was working. And I knew... He can't have something I don't have. Many of the time, I wrestled that through. In those early days, I wrestled through. But he's got a gift. He's got a gift. He talks about a gift. He's got, he's got a gift. He discerns people and all this stuff. You know, he's got a special gift. He was a very gifted man. I said, but, but in myself, in my youth, in my integrity, on my knees, with my Bible, I said, but Lord, that can't make the difference. This is your word. I am me. You are in me. Wow. That, that was the fact that I learned. I didn't know it said that. I didn't know it said that I could heal the sick and cast out devils and cleanse lepers. Even without any gifts that I was conscious of. Are you hearing me? My identity was Christ. I want to share something here. The inspiration of our identity with Jesus. You've heard me tell that story in Africa. I was teaching Nakuru. We finished the crusade. We had a big seminar. We invited all the preachers, all kinds of preachers and gospel workers to come and be part of it. There was a young guy that had been converted. They called him a pagan. Now, they call him pagan, but they do that out there. That if, 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 he, if he is from a, a tribal religion, witchcraft, and all that, they call him pagans. Now, I didn't call him pagan. I think that's a harsh word in today. Uh, the connotation today is harsh. So I, I, I try not to use that word. But, you know, unbelievers and non-Christians, there's lots of ways you can say it. But they called him pagan. So he, got, he had gotten saved in the meeting. I didn't know anything about it. He had never heard the gospel. He came and got saved. Good-looking fellow, probably 25 years old, a little bit short, but real good-looking, real handsome, but just as black as ebony. Just really black. Just a beautiful, typical, handsome, muscular, wonderful young fellow. Well, uh, one of the pastors, Brother Silas O'Weedy, said, Brother Aldrin, so, uh, he wants to come. I said, let him come. Well, it hurt. Let him come. Okay. We just wanted to know. Yeah. Well, he came. Well, I didn't know who he was. Didn't know anything about it. I, could, I didn't distinguish him from, from the preachers. We had all a couple of thousand in, in, the, in the meeting. And uh, so I was sitting down to teach. And uh, all of a sudden, I had this almost trite inspiration. I said, hey. I said, how many would like to know what Jesus looks like in Africa? Boy, that opened their eyes. They really, it just really, it was a good question for them. They'd never thought of that. They presumed Jesus looked like a Jew. They hadn't thought about what does he look like in Africa. And so, to illustrate my point, I just pointed back there at random, that fellow, I said, come on, Jesus. It was him, it was that ex-pagan. I didn't know that. 
doesn't come up here. He came up here, good looking fellow, and I was sitting down, he was standing there beside me. So I, I held his hand and I was talking about it. I said, look at him. That's what Jesus looks like in Africa. I'm just so glad, I'm, I'm just so sorry I didn't call a lady. See, that would have really helped the women. Sometime in the future, I'm going to do that and call a lady. That'll really shock them. <laughs> Either Jesus can look like a lady or Jesus can't be in a lady. See? One or the other. He stood there. I said, that's what he looks like. And they were amazed. And then I took his hand and I said, see, look at us. I said, our color on the outside is different, but I turned away. I said, inside we're the same color. I said, we can give each other blood. I said, our blood is the same. One blood, everybody. Well, they thought that was wonderful. And I went ahead and preached, uh, teaching, and I was holding his hand. And I said, you see, when Jesus was up there around Jerusalem, he looked like a Jew. His hair was long, and his nose was tall. Africans call our noses tall. So his nose was tall, and his ears were probably floppy like mine. And, uh, and, and I, I made a few expressions like that, and I said he was a lighter, lighter complexion. I said, in Africa, you see, this is what he looks like. His hair is more curly, and his ears might tend to be a little bit smaller, and his, I said, his skin be darker. I said, it's the same Jesus. I said, see, when Jesus was around Jerusalem, he healed people. He laid a hand that looked like a Jew's hand on people. I said, here in Africa, he lays a hand that looks like an African on people because he needs our flesh. About that time, hot splashes of water were dropping on us. I didn't. First, I thought, wait. I had big old tears like diamonds rolling down his black cheeks. He got the idea. See, he wasn't prejudiced by previous indoctrination. He got the idea. When that meeting was over, he packed his few little belongings in a little gunny sack. They said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to be a missionary. They said, what? You can't do that. Yes. He said, Jesus said I can, and he also said I can. See, and he's going to be a missionary. They said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the Maasai. 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 That's a big, tall tribe. Boy, they are aristocratic. Even the government treats them with kid gloves. Nobody bothers them. Nomadic tribe that travel with their cattle all across Kenya and some of the most prestigious people in Africa, the Maasai. These were the Maasai. The, the preachers, the missionaries, haven't been able to make a dent in the Maasai. But that little guy went. Isn't that beautiful? Showing you what inspiration will do. I needed inspiration when I got back from India. I got inspiration watching Branham and watching those miracles and going to the Word of God and then putting it to the test and it was working. Wow, I was inspired. Yes, I was inspired. Until the day he was taken up to the last, everything he did turned me on. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. A revival broke out among the Maasai. I understand this. To this day, it, it, it's the greatest move of God that's happened yet among the Maasai. That ex pagan that got the idea of what a Christian is. That Jesus is in that person and that he does the work, but we give him our flesh and let him work through it. And trust him and give out his word as seed and know it will grow. We're, we're, we're infallible. Absolutely. We'll succeed every time. That seed is God's seed. It is divine seed. When we plant it in people's lives, it will grow those lives. It will change towns, villages, nations. It will work. We are nation changers. We are. You believe it? Oh yes, I know you. I'm fixing to go in something here real heavy, so it might be a good time to take a break. Ten minute break, you think so? Might be a good idea.
Let's take a 10 minute break and come back. And I'm going to take you into this, this, this trail across uh, the Gospels. <clears throat> That'll be promptly 10 minutes. And I, I do want to. First to memorize. That's a life to live. Remember that when you face tough time. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not even by my own faith, but by His faith that's imparted to me. His faith doesn't waver. Mine may, but not His. Him who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 6 and 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's not in the future only. That's now. Being dead with Christ, we live with Christ. Colossians 2, 9. In Him, in Him, say in Him, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10. And you are complete in Him. Now, we can look. Hey, listen. Listen to this. Never forget this. Paul, the rabbi, it was incumbent upon him as a rabbi to be able to have committed to memory all of the books of Moses, all of the Psalms, all of the prophets. They drilled them from little boys, drilling them, drilling them, drilling them, drilling them, until a rabbi knew it all. But he missed the issue. He missed the issue. We can drill ourselves and commit to memory these beloved verses of enrichment and miss the issue. Contradict it in the next statement that we make after we quote it. Let's don't do that. Let's, let's train ourselves to, to embrace the truth that we read. You are complete in him. He's the head of all principality and power. How could we ever hesitate about devils and read something like that? How could we? How could I not laugh at devils in my audience if I believe that? He is the head of all principality and power. You don't think the devil, the poor devil knows that. That's why he respects me. I don't say that to be braggy. That's fact, baby. That's fact. That's fact. That's fact. Verse 12, Colossians 2. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are raised with him to the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. We're dead with him. We're buried with him. We're risen with him. We're identified with him. E.W. Kenyon gives us all of this truth plus mountains more in his little pocketbook identification. I think it's a great book. By the way, there's a lot of scare, scarecrow Stuff floating around, you know, uh, condemning Brother Kenyon as a metaphysician, uh, metaphysicist, I guess I should say, and, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a mind over matter man, a Mary Baker Eddy Christian science man, because he grew up in the epoch in 1880 up to 1940, during that epoch was when Mary Baker Eddy 
and all of this metaphysicist teaching uh, proliferated across the nation to the point that it was a great conflict across the nation and uh, the fundamental evangelicals all took up arms against all of that breed of teaching because they were influencing so many Christians. The church, the fundamental churches had gone stale and rather dead and lifeless and of course they were against miracles and all that stuff, you know. I always did say if the church would have preached divine healing, Mary Baker Eddy never would have had a reason to exist. She, she couldn't have come along at all. And, uh, and what I'm going to teach you today, uh, New Age never could have proliferated in America if the church had taught what I'm, gonna, what I'm teaching you today. We, we failed, and so the New Age comes in, and you've got tens of thousands. It's just a new name. They called it metaphysics back then, or Christian science. They just keep hatching new names. There's a breed of thought that's out there that makes God into a mystical being, a form of Hinduism for America. That's all it is, a form of Hinduism in America. But we are Christians. We're Christians. We're alive with his life. Are you hearing me? We are buried with him. We are raised. Did I confuse you about that? I was talking about identification in Kenyon's book, Identification. It's a wonderful little book. I love his book. First John 4 and 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because... You ever hear that verse? Greater is the one that's in you than he that's in you. Then believe that. Embrace that. No devil is bigger than you. You hear, it's a big witch doctor coming up. Big deal. See? Come on. Embrace it. He is greater in me. Why? Of course, I'm complete in him. He's God. He's above all principal and power. You think the devil don't know that? He keeps tabs on them. The story of the seven sons of Siva proves that. They said, we know Paul. We don't know you. See? Now, don't let that spook you and think, oh, if I'd cast out enough devils like Lester Summerall, then the devils would know me. No, 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 no. The devils judge you by what you know. You may not have had a chance to prove it yet, but they judge you by what you know. When you know the truth, the truth sets you free. When you know and you know that Christ died in your name. And you know that your old life died with him. And you know that God raised him from the dead. And you know that you were raised from the dead. And you know that he sat down at the right hand of the Father and you're seated with him. Friends, I believe that. That don't make me brag and, and, and blow hot air. No, no, I know those things. Either redemption is a fact or it's a farce. I embrace it. It is life to me. Billy Graham said so many years ago, there are a few things in the Bible I'm not sure that I understand, but I can easily leave them to him. Embracing what I do understand, I absolutely embrace it. To minister to people, to minister to people, you've got to be convincing. To be convincing, you've got to be convinced. Never forget it. Never forget it. First John 5, 11. This is the record that God has given to us. Eternal life. This life is in His Son. And whoever has the Son has this life. You have not the Son, you have not life. John 1, 14. We mentioned before. The Word became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld Him, we beheld God in Jesus. 
full of grace and truth. Wow. We beheld God in Jesus. When I think of India, when I think of the world, but particularly India, because India is so smart. Sounds like other nations aren't. I don't mean that. I mean, India is ancient. India is ancient. The Indian mind is something different. Uh, it, it's remarkable. When I think of India, with all of their, their gods, so many gods, I hear God saying to me, T.L., tell India, I'm like Jesus. Hindu statesman said, I have no interest in a holy God that sits on his throne and takes no interest in hurting people. I want a God that will come down to the dusty roads where people live. He said, I hear talk about this Jesus Christ. I've read about his life. He helped people. If there could be a God that was like Jesus, he could have my life. Am I just rambling? Look at me. I'm talking to potential preachers. I'm talking to young people. I'm talking to you. You're, you, you have visions. You want to go change your world. I'm telling you, Get Jesus in you. Get Jesus in you. Let him fill you totally until you become, until you learn to grow in the image of him. To the stature of the full measure of Christ. I'm not saying try to be holy and pious like you think, like the artist's would impress your mind that Jesus was with a flimsy uh, gown, you know, and a nice little halo. No, he was tough. He was tough and rugged and real. You understand that? Be like him. Let him, let him become part of you. Now, now listen. Paul said, Paul talked about the greatest Revelation that he received when he's off down there in Arabia and he got saved, preached Christ at once, all the things that he had missed in the Old Testament came booming real to him. He must have thought, my God, how could I have missed it? I read that all my life. I memorized it. I've quoted it. I know it can be. His, his brain must have been like a computer whirling those scriptures through his mind after he saw Jesus. And he saw Jesus everywhere. You know, that's the way revelation is. When it hits you, then you see it everywhere. All through the scripture, it becomes alive. Paul, can you imagine how Paul must have felt? Paul, this man that, 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 that understood, he tried to get in the church, but they were scared of him. They didn't know a good convert when they saw it. <laughs> you know, and he had gone and, and went off down to Arabia, said, these folks won't believe in me anyhow. I'll go down there, and they won't worry about me. And, and, and there, there he waited before God. Huh? Probably he didn't need to carry the scrolls with him. He had them in his, in his heart and in his mind. He was such a, a wizard, such a wise man, so knowledgeable in the Scriptures. But he had to go down there and think it all over, ponder it all afresh with a new star to follow. Jesus. He had been trying to kill people, Galatians 1. And then he realized... My God, 
from the day you separated me from mother's womb, you chose me to reveal Jesus to me. See, that's your calling. Huh? Now, that's the toughest lesson to get across to Christians. Paul knew all the Old Testament scriptures and missed that. I want to take you on a little journey. Think about it now. Think about it. Jesus comes. Remember what I told you. He came to show us God. We know that. He came to show us God. We understand God when we see Jesus. I tell the Hindus, God is like Jesus. You've heard of Jesus. Well, God is like Him. I emphasize that in the world. It brings light to people. God is like Jesus. God is spirit. He wanted us to know what he's like, so he sent his son Jesus. Jesus showed us God. God is like Jesus. Whatever idea you've got about God that's not like Jesus is not a true idea. God is like Jesus. That's preaching instead of teaching. Can I say it again? God is like Jesus. You want to know what Jesus is like? Look at God. You, you, you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. That is the whole concept of redemption that God revealed to St. Paul. All of his epistles, wrap them all up this is what you've got. Jesus in him. Now the reason this was so difficult to get across to society, religious society, religion, their indoctrinization closed their minds. We have to watch. When we're indoctrinated, we quit thinking. Indoctrinization is to tell you what to think about every scripture. You read that scripture, you know what to think. And you can miss the gold mine. Because your brain works for you that way, and, and, and you focus, and you get an imprint of every scripture, and that's what it means. Paul knew that about all of the Old Testament. He missed the Christ. May God help us Pentecostals not to do that. So the whole thing that Jesus came to do was to get people to accommodate this idea that God, that He could come in you. That God could come in you. Now the shocking thing to me, and I have to admit it angers me, when I teach like this in America, they say, uh-oh, Osborne is in new age. And that, that, that almost antagonizes me, but I'm, I have to consider the ignorance of those who say it. The biggest idea that God had, the only idea that God had from the beginning, are you hearing me, was to get people to understand, hey, I want to be in you. That's all. The whole Bible is for that. That's all it's for. If we get that, that's what the way we can help the world. God in us, we can do anything. God is limitless. Now watch it. Watch it. It was God's dream in the beginning created Adam and Eve. The in them. He was in them. Breathed in them. Imparted himself in them. It's true. You're in your child, aren't you? Yes, yes. 
They look like you, act like you, talk like you, look people like you, hair like you, other. You're done. You're, you're living for, you die, but you live on in them. God reproduces himself in us and lives on in us. God lives in us. Is it any wonder that when we lay hands on the sick, the healed, or we talk to people, they get well, or we touch people, if we recognize God in us, and if we let, and if we, and if we let God be complete in us, and that's where all the teaching of the scriptures builds God into. If we let his, his love be in us, his, uh, his compassion be in us, not condemnation, not judgment, not bigotry, not prejudice, God. What's God like? Look at Jesus. You can see what God's like. Look at Jesus. Let that God be in you that came in flesh and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth, not full of condemnation and bigotry and bias and prejudice, race prejudice, gender prejudice, gender prejudice. No. God. We're talking about God. Now, 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 are you getting this? This is what God wants. Hey, class, if we get this lesson today, we can go places. But religion puts the brakes on this and says, watch it, watch it. Well, if you've been where I've been, You'd be glad you know this stuff. And them folks said, watch it. He's posing too holy. They've never cast out a devil as big as a peanut. That's the truth. They're the pontificates. They're the theoreticians. They're the nobodies. Going nowhere but ruling the world. We've always had them. But God is wanting to be in people. In people. And he don't have any flesh of his own. He's spirit and he spooks people if he comes around in his spirit. But if he can be in someone, he can relate to people and they won't be scared of him and run from him. Why should we, why should we resist that idea? It's the secret of ministry. I'm talking about the Christ connection. The miracle life and miracle ministry. Now when Jesus came, that was the deal. That was the concept that he had to get across. Now look, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And tippy-toeing through them, we can pick up, I haven't, it's, I haven't done it thoroughly, but we can pick up the idea, the delicacy of the mention of the subject. Still today, now you're an open crowd, but if this was in a public arena, most of the folks would be frightened to hear me talk like that. They were when Jesus came. Now look at it a little bit. John 1, 14, read this twice already. The Word, God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now John perceived that by the Holy Spirit revealed to him. God became flesh in Jesus. When we saw Jesus, we were seeing God at work in human flesh. Right? Full of grace and truth. Verse 18. John 1. Verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. But the Son has declared Him. Hallelujah. 
Isn't that, isn't that funny? Now watch, watch. Now John, John's talking here. This isn't Jesus. John's talking here. See, he's laying it out there. He got the revelation. He caught on by the Spirit. Hallelujah. And you go over John 5, and you see, the, oh, the marvels, the miracles in John 5. That's, that's you know, that's that pool of Bethesda where it said, in these lay a great multitude of important folk, John 5 and 3, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Here is a picture. John is giving us the picture of the world. The world. You and I are facing that same kind of a world. They're lying all around us. And an angel went down to a certain sea. Sometimes, once in a while, even God don't have any flesh to work through, so he'll do it through an angel, or he'll do it through his spirit. He'll come in a visitation, or a dream, or a vision. Now and then, he'll do some wonderful thing. But oh, how he would like to do it with flesh and blood, and touch, and look, and talk, and be real about it. But no, he just got, once in a while, <laughs> an angel come down and did something great. And the one poor fellow was there with an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, you know, here was God in the flesh. They're still wanting spirits. Hey, does that ring a bell? I said, here's God in the flesh. And they're still wanting spirits. Think about that. Don't miss it. Oh, how we want people to be spiritual. Can I say something? Religion spiritualizes God. You got that? Don't miss that, because I'm coming with another one. Jesus humanized God. He needs flesh. We're flesh. And he's poured out his spirit on our flesh. John chapter 1, verse 17. Sorry, chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> This was a big hullabaloo, caused a big problem. All these people, this man getting healed, and the folks wanted to kill him. The religious folks wanted to kill him because he did it on the wrong day. And Jesus is delicately introducing this idea of him showing them that God is working in him. Now, those were fighting words in religion. Jesus, a rabbi in town, saying, God is at work in him. Fighting words. You know, he read that scripture when he first came out of the wilderness and stood up in the, in, in the synagogue and read Isaiah, what we have is Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord. It, he, must have read, he must have said that like he believed it. And they said, we got to kill this guy. He believes that stuff. It's all right for us to read it, but after all, we don't take it serious. I mean, this guy's carried away. He really thinks the Spirit of God is on him. Come on, we better kill this guy. He's trying to be such a holier than thou. Yeah, yeah, come on, face it. Look at it like it was. They didn't like it. Jesus is, has got to show them what he's like, that God is in him. And he says in verse 17, after all this hullabaloo, he says, my father works, and I work. Wow. Boy, did that bring the ears up. My father works, and I work. Big deal. Yeah, who does he think he is? My father works, and I work. Wasn't he tender? Wasn't he delicate? He has to get this through to people for them to understand redemption. They're so religiously bigoted against this idea. God is holy. God is awesome. We are nobodies. But we are the authority. And we know we're nobodies. And we'll be sure nobody else becomes somebody. You know. 
That's our burden. My father works, and I work. You didn't fuss about the Sabbath. So you did it the wrong day. If you'd done it on Thursday, we wouldn't have fussed about it. But you, my father works, and I work. And verse 19 and verse 30, he repeats it. The son, the son, son of who? The son can do nothing by himself. See, that's the way we are. We can't do, we're, we're totally helpless. But it's Christ in us. Paul said, the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He redeemed me from my sins through his own blood. I have redemption. Hallelujah. And, and, and in him, in him, he is everything. I'm complete in him. But Jesus and we, I can do nothing by myself. Now see, he's, he's trying to give them a little slack here so they won't get too excited. Verse 20, he says, The Father loves the Son. How about that? How about that? The Father loves the Son and shows Him the things that He Himself does. See? Hey, hey, did you ever think about this? The Father shows the Son what He wants done. The Christ connection. We're connected. We're not strangers. We're not foreigners. We're hooked up with God. God works through us. Brother Bosworth gave me a little prayer that he prayed every day. He was in Japan. He went to Japan once after he knew me. He got so turned up, bless him. Turned on, bless his heart. He went to Japan to have some meat. He said, Brother Osmond and I had stayed longer, but I couldn't get warm. <laughs> he was old, you know. But he, he was still had the fire in him. After that, he went to South Africa. But he gave me this little prayer that he prayed every day he was in Japan. I, I, I've got it written down. I don't have it with me. But, but some of the lines said, Tune my emotions to your emotions. Tune my will to your will. Let me feel what you feel. Let me see these people like you see these people. See, that's real prayer. That's real prayer. See, he says, he says, the Father shows the Son the things that He Himself does. Wow, when I first heard that, that was such a mystery to me. That was so overwhelming to me. And as I've grown older and minister, that's so simple. Of course, He shows us what he wants by looking at Jesus. If I want to know what he wants, I look at Jesus. In that kind of circumstance, I know exactly what he wants. And my faith, his faith in me is ready for that challenge and expresses itself and knows that its expressions are seed and the seed cannot be destroyed because it's the incorruptible seed of the Word of God that lives and abides forever. Glory to God. And we state it and it happens. Glory to God. I pray that something of me can pour out to you and you'll go out and some maybe some pictures of my teaching will linger in your mind and in your heart spot. Maybe you'll remember something I said and you'll come to me. Yeah. Poor devil. Yeah. You know, that's what influence is. That's the only reason I'm here. I'm not here for your money. I'm not here for your attention. I'm not here to schedule interviews. I love you. Your, 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 your potential. You're people of God. You're chosen. You're wonderful. And if I can, if I can pour out to you a week, boy, what a chance you've given me here. Three days. My goodness. <clears throat> wonderful. Wonderful. He shows the things he does. He shows him his will. You ever think about that? Now, let me take you to help you on that. 
Go over to Acts 22, verse 14, 15. This is Paul relating his experience. This man knew so much about God, knew nothing. He knew nothing. He was a great, awesome, potentate, harsh, mean, killing everybody that didn't agree with him. Paul out doing him service, whacking them down, beating them until they cursed the name of Jesus. Big deal. But one vision of Jesus. That's like it was with me. Our cases were different. I wasn't mad to anybody, but I couldn't get anything done. But one vision of Jesus. Wow, that changed me forever. That's as fresh today as it was the morning he walked into my room in that limbo order. Hallelujah. But look at this Acts 22. This Paul, he's re re relating his story. He says, the God of our fathers. He's telling about how Ananias came in and talked to him. He said, the God of our Father has chosen you. Say, He's chosen me. That you should know His will. Why not? How could we not know His will? We have His Word. We have the record of Jesus. We have His emotions. We understand how He did things, how He reacted to things. We study His posturing with people, His visiting, His talking. We know His will. And we have His Word and we have His Spirit that works in us and we wait before Him and His, the Holy Spirit attunes us to His Spirit. Finally, attunes us. Hallelujah. And the devil's in trouble. Glory to God. Did you notice that? Chosen you to know his will. Oh, preachers, this will preach. Preach this. I, I've never preached this. I just, I just, I always want to when I read it. Know his will. He's chosen you. He's chosen you, number one, that you should know his will. Number two, that you should see the just one. Oh, that's just. See right. See the just one. See what he did. See how he prayed for us. See how he died for us. See his vicarious work for us. That we should see, see, see. That we should see. Paul said, should see what I missed. I missed it. I knew all the scriptures, but I missed it. Oh, God has chosen you that you should know his will. And that you should see that just and that you should hear the voice of his mouth. See? Christ connection. I am connected. I hear the message. I know the will. I see the source. For you shall be his witness. Yeah. How, how else can we represent him? If we don't hear his voice, know his will, see him. If you see him and know his will and hear his voice, you be his witness. And all the devils in the village will know that a great one has come to town when you arrive and will advise their demons to clear out. Because one of the great ones who knows has come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Excuse me for stutting a little bit about that. That devil I hate him. A liar, a destroyer, a manipulator, an accuser, a no good, a hypocrite, a puff of wind, hot air, no truth in him, nothing but lies, I'm against him. I'm for Jesus. All for Jesus. Only for Jesus. Hallelujah. I'll only preach Jesus. Only Jesus. Even when I go to Brazil. I'm preaching only Jesus. I'm preaching down there, preaching about the devil all over the place. Writing books about the devil. 
They lead to you. Yeah. But I'll be careful. I'll be careful. Any tribe will fight to the death to defend their gods. Never forget that. Some folks like to them. If they didn't have him around, they'd have nothing to preach about. They'll defend their God. But Jesus is Lord. Take it from me, Jesus is Lord. Look at Romans 12 and 2. Did you ever notice this? Be transformed. Don't be, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That makes my mind like the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. That's what pours into me. Look at it. All marked up, messed up. I pour over it. I look into it. It comes alive to me. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? 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 Come on. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect? Look at that word, will of God. Will of God. We're Christ connected. We concern God's will. Let, let, me, let me read that verse to you in today's English version. There's a translation that's called today's English version. I didn't even know I had it, but I looked at it and I, and I read it and I liked it. Listen to it. It says, Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing to Him. Yeah, yeah, you will. When you're, when you're, when you're transformed by this. See. Then you'll be able to know the will of God. Yeah. God said to Paul, I've chosen you that you may know my will. When He chooses you, you know His will. Tradition makes us excuse ourselves from His will. Make excuses for His will. We know His will. Do it. We'd rather ask questions. Do it. If I open up to preach and let them talk to me personally, they'll bring to me all sorts of things I can see in their eyes. They already know. Well, you can't embarrass people and say, shut up, you already know. No, you've got to be courteous and listen. But they're talking stuff they already know, their mind's already made up. They know, but they haven't practiced doing it. G.L. the Great One, simple. I just, have, from a young person, I've done it. If it said it, I do it. Simple. Nothing to, if it says it, I believe it. I go act on it. It worked. A good deal. Me and God's both happy. Simple. That's not cocky. That's not being super important. No. That would be stupid to be like that. It's all Christ connection. Without Him, I can do nothing. But I'm connected. I'm not going to deny my connection. I'm connected. Hallelujah. The Jerusalem Bible is nice on that verse. It says, this is the only way. See, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, you know, the Word of God. This is the only, the Jerusalem Bible, this is the only way to discover the will of God. Now, you might try that sometime. Instead of praying all day, what does God want you to do? I have a friend that half of his, he's in heaven now, half of his life, he's a preacher, half of his life he was praying about the will of God, wanting to know what God wanted to do, and undecided, you know, what, what to do, what to do. And the other half of his life, wondering if he made the right decision. And he went to heaven. Well, good man, went to heaven, precious. But see how much you miss. You can load yourself with questions. We are to know the will of God. We are connected. Don't deny our connection. If we're connected, we're not nobodies. If we're connected, we know things. 
But we got to do things. We don't do things in our own strength. We do things in the power of the Holy Ghost that raised Jesus from the dead. That power is working in us. Resurrection power in us. You can bank on it. And that don't make us strut and act like we're super important. Everybody has this same power. Everybody. Everybody has the same. The only way we can discover the will of God, the Jewish and the Bible says, and to know what is good and what God wants. I know what God wants. God wants to make people happy and better and peaceful and kind. What else is in life? Come on, what else is in life? Here's a human. We're about humans. Here's a human. What do we want to do? What does God want? God wants them to be kind and happy. Oh, God wants them to have peace. God don't want them to go to bed at night scared. If Jesus comes, I might not be. No, no, no. God wants them to have peace, tranquility. He wants them to enjoy gardens. They like gardens or whatever. He wants them to be happy. He wants them to be kind to people. He wants them to be loving. That's my ministry. I'm trying to get people to be like that. I'm making people like that. I've made the world better. My 55 years in the world, in, 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 in 78 countries, I made the world better. Millions of people today are happy, at peace, go to bed happy, all that, because they heard T.L. Oakland teach them about Jesus. That's the ministry. That's the ministry. And where there's a need, need a miracle, well, the Spirit of God's in me. God wants that more than I want it. You, you remember my story when I first when I first found out all this, and then I, we decided, boy, we're going to go have a campaign. We're going to have a crusade in the church. And so I spent three days fasting and praying in the basement. You know what I was praying for? And I was serious. I mean, it took a, quite a while to, to reorganize my prayer life. Prayer, prayer, praying. Most folks pray for things that God's, already that God wants to do more than you want it done and that he's or, or that he's already said that, he, that he's already accomplished and it's finished or that he's already said that he's ready to do and wants to do it and we're trying to get him interested in it. I prayed five weeks trying to get God interested in a sinner and couldn't get God interested in a sinner. The sinner came every night and begged for salvation. I couldn't get God interested in it. Now ain't that a joke? Are you hearing me? Come on, you went... You went stale on me. I said, I tried five weeks to get God interested in a sinner. What all was I ignoring in my ministry and in my understanding of the scriptures that made me spend five weeks trying to get God interested in a sinner? He came every night. I preached five weeks. He came every night to altar, every night, and he couldn't get saved. And we'd beg and cry, and he couldn't get saved. Couldn't get God to save him. Now, ain't that ignorance? That, that, that's really pretty far down on the ladder. I was a preacher. Churches wanted me. We were music, musical. The last night I got worried about it because I thought, boy, he, I, I think I was more interested in my reputation than in his soul. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I'm telling you, I was thinking, what will these pastors think if they hear a sinner came five weeks to my altar and couldn't get saved? I got to do something about that. So, I, I lucked into the solution. <laughs> it's an awful way to put it, but it's the truth. I, I was figuring on that. What am I going to do? So I went down there beside the last night. I had to do something. I said, hey, look. I said, your prayers ain't doing any good. And mine aren't either. I said, we've got to do something different. He agreed with me. <laughs> we were both at wit's end. <laughs> And so I, I put my arm around. I said, listen, I'll tell you what. You say what I say. Okay. He was willing to try anything. So you know what? I had the bright idea to quote scriptures. <laughs> I'm telling you. Salvation scriptures. So I quoted them. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So say it. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> His blood was shed for many for the remission of sin. His blood was shed for many. 
I got about three scriptures and he took off shouting. Now, now, I'm telling you. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Converted. Saved. Could have been the first night. Five weeks of agony. I was in that basement praying. We were going to have that crusade. I was praying three nights. Hungry, hungry. Three days and nights. No water, no food, not a drop. Hungry, lank, needy. Wanting to be sure God was interested in them sick people down there. When I got down there and I was praying, Lord, when we get down there and we minister to them and I'll see those lines of people and they stand before me and I lay my hands on them. Lord, be there and let your power come and heal them for me. And I'd pray that every hour, every day. I'd pray and pray and pray and pray. pray. Heal them for me. Heal them. Oh, Lord, when I lay them, heal them for me. Heal them for me. Heal them. And, and one day, well, the third day, it took me three days to listen to them on prayer. You know, we say such silly things when we pray. Come on. we got to grow up in our prayer life. Quit begging God to do what He's already promised to do. Quit begging God to do what's already accomplished. And learn to plug in. I'm talking Christ's connection. We're connected. It's real. We've got it. It's so. It's flowing. The current's hot. But we got to believe it. Hallelujah. And I heard the echo of my voice. Heal them, for Heal them. Heal them. For who? For who? Heal them for me. For who? For who? For who? And right there on my knees. Thank God I fasted and prayed those three days. Maybe that opened my spirit. Got rid of all my stuff, you know. <laughs> so, and, 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 and I, I pondered. 2,000 years before you were ever interested in sick people. I gave my son to the Snyders and they plowed his back like a farmer plowed a field. And by those stripes, the sick were made whole. And you just now wanting to be sure that I'm interested in sick people? He profoundly affected That was in the early beginning. Profoundly John 5.30. Jesus trying to show people this idea. I seek not my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. Those were fighting words. Jesus is acting so pious. He's talking more and more about his father. Look, are, are you with me? Is my focus lasting too long? Have you lost? Has it blurred on you? I'm talking about Jesus trying to get us to catch on to the idea that God wants to be in us. And the only way he can get that idea across to us is to come and show us how God is in him. But if he tells them God is in him just outright, they'll all kill him for it because they don't want that but he's got to get it across to him before he dies for us to show us how it will be. And so he's talking a little more. I, I, I seek not my own will. I seek the will of my Father which sent me. Okay? Verse 36, John 5, 36. The works that the Father gave me to finish, these works I do. Now, are you getting the point? I'm not just quoting a litany of Scriptures. I'm making a point to you. Jesus is showing us what God wants us to know that he can be in a person. Now they're still seeing him as the great one. He's the miracle worker. Wow. Awesome. Scared of him. He's trying to get him to come down where he is. works that my father gave me to finish, these works I do. He's saying, all these things that I'm doing, my father's doing these things. Is that what you say when you go out and minister to people? That, that's what it is. It's your father ministering. 
you're doing the works of your Father because you have learned His will and you function in His will. And what you do, no devil can stop it because the will of God will come to pass. Verse 26, chapter 5 of John. The Father has life and the Son has life. Now look, that we quote that so glibly. But look what he's saying. The Father has life. The Son has life. life. See, he's getting closer to this. Do we understand the life? See, Paul's revelation. The life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so that I could be ransomed from my sins through his blood and be redeemed. Pure, justified, nothing standing against me. See, what a revelation, Paul. Well, Jesus is introducing it. Paul said it clear. But Jesus was introducing it little by little by little. John 6, 38. I came down from the Father to do His will. See? What do you think? You go to Africa. I came to Africa to do the will of my Father. Sure. Sure. And if you're hooked up with Him, the Christ connection, you can do His will. John 6, 57. I live by the Father. What do you think? I live by God. You say it in other ways. Is that real to you? Is that real? I live by the Father. John 8, 26. He's getting a little closer. I speak to the world the things I have heard of my Father. Did you hear that statement? I speak to the world the things I've heard from my Father. See, he's trying to get them to catch on to the connection. This was new stuff. This was dangerous. They'd kill you for this. They finally did kill him for it. John 8, 28. As the Father has taught me that's what I speak. See? Those religious people were hating him for saying it. Friends, hey, why am I saying this? If we don't understand this, we are in trouble. John 10, 25. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. I do these works in his name. They're the works of God. They prove that I'm coming from God. Look what he said next, verse 38. If I do these works, even though you don't believe me, believe the works. Now listen to what he said. You can say this. That you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in the Father. You want some more? Now he's working on this. He's leading them. He's showing them. They had come far enough, he could say it a little stronger. Watch it. Watch it. We're up to 14 now. Chapter 14, verse 9. Whoever has seen me, oh boy, hold on, has seen the Father. This was killing words. Friends, friends, if you don't realize that when you step off of an airplane or get off of a ship and go into a village, that God has come to that village in His fullness. And it might be you oughtn't to go. That's what we are. That don't mean we get off bragging, strutting. If we don't believe that, then when we face the devil, we'll run. You see why I feel so strong about these simple truths? Until the day he was taken up, he inspired me. He is my model. He is my inspiration. He is my catalyst. He is my stimulus. Everything he said about his father, 
I can say about my father. You can say about your father. And that's what makes a minister. A miracle minister. A minister of life. I keep coming back to this one thing. I, I just keep need to keep saying it to people. I know that it bugs us when we go out and we say the words and we don't see the results exactly as we want it. But we must believe in the power of the seed. But if we believe in the power of the seed, we must be sure that it's the seed of the truth of God that goes through our lips into people, irrespective of what we see, that the seed of the gospel, of the revelation of Jesus, flows through us. I'm amazed at many people who can preach a long time, and you don't hardly hear them talk about Jesus. They talk about the Holy Ghost, don't they? I think the Holy Spirit is embarrassed. I don't think we're supposed to preach all the time about the Holy Spirit. I, I want to be careful in saying that because here in America, well, we do that a lot. That's all right. But, but, but I believe that Jesus is the star and we should keep him first. I believe that. I believe. And I believe the ministry of the <clears throat> Holy Ghost is to take Jesus and reveal him. Now, let's go a little bit further here. What's this? He's got them far enough he could say in 14 and 9, Whoever seen me has seen the Father. Verse 11, Believe me, I am... Oh, it's getting strong. See, he's coming closer. He'll be crucified. He'll lay down his life for this. He says in 11, Believe me, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Second time he said it. Friends, God wants us to comprehend this truth. Our identification with Christ is what inspires me day and night. My identity. Now he could go a step further. Could you go further than that? Yeah, listen. John 14, verse 16. I'll pray the Father. He'll send you the Holy Spirit. You can't see Him, but you know Him. That was mysterious. Verse 17. He's been dwelling with you. Jesus is saying this rather mystically because He was saying I've been with you. I've been with you. And the Holy Spirit is in me. See, he couldn't be in them. Their sins weren't washed away yet. You understand about that? You, hey, you understand? Don't, don't miss that. Hey, that's deep. You understand about that? Nobody in the Old Testament or the Gospels except Jesus could have God in them. Nobody. No prophet. Not Moses. Not Elijah. Nobody. Nobody. That was what God wanted. He wanted it. He wanted it. Sent Jesus to show us how it would be. And he's introducing this. He says, he's been dwelling with you. Yeah, like, like on the prophets and on those. And, and, and with you in another sense because he's in me and I'm with you. But, hallelujah, 14, 17, he will be in you. He will be in you. It's getting hotter. It's getting warmer. It keeps getting closer. John 14, verse 20. You are going to know that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Why does he keep repeating this? And the same struggle continues. And when I go out across the country and talk like this, they say he's new age. See, that same devil is still trying to divert that truth and scare people away because it seems too holy. My friends, we've got to discard our claim 
for the Holy Ghost if we're not willing for Jesus to be alive in us because the Holy Ghost takes Jesus and brings him into us and manifests him through us. Do you understand that? That's so important that we know that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah for good measure. John 14, 21 keeps getting better. Listen, if you believe me and my word, my Father and I will love you and will come and manifest ourselves to you. Manifest, exhibit, demonstrate. Hey, are, are you taking these words in? My Father and I will come and exhibit ourselves in you. That's T.L. Osborne on the mark. That's not bragging. That's, that's, he's smiling at that. He said, yes, yes, son, that's right. That's what I've been trying to get you to catch on. That's what I revealed to Paul. That's why I gave you the scripture. Yes, 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 yes. You're letting me be in you so that you're not afraid of devils and you cast them out and you heal the sick and you lift fallen people and people that are down on themselves. You encourage them and lift them up and make them beautiful people and people that are nobodies. You make somebody's out of That's me doing it through you. You're letting me flow. My words are flowing through you. See, that's the will of God. That's the identification. That's the Christ connection. That's my inspiration. Until the day he was taken up, boy, until the last day, he did things that I marvel at and challenge me and say, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's my ministry. That's the way I deal with people. That's the way I help people. Yes, yes. And it goes on. That's not all of it. How will he manifest himself? How will he come to us? How, how, how? They said in verse 22, how? Look at it. So how will this happen? How can this happen? He had them all stirred up. Well, read verse 23. And I said, I prefixed verse 23, said, well, it all is based on love. <laughs> it's all based on love. If you can understand love, you can take it in. It says, when you love me and keep my words, my Father will love you, and we will come to you and make our abode with you. Isn't that powerful? It's right there before our eyes all the time. Verse 26. The Holy Spirit will remind you of all the things that I've told you. See? Do you believe that? No. Yeah. Verse 27. Oh, this is precious. And you'll have my peace. Wow. Brother Morelli, I have peace. I have peace. I'm not scared. I'm not scared of demons. I'm not scared of God. No. Scared of God? No. no. I'm not scared of angels. No. <laughs> but... Let's go to John 15. We've got to keep traveling. Here, we're not through. Hey, hey, we're working on this one deal. You live in me, and I'll live in... He's getting it stronger. Boy, it's about time for him to kill him. They can't let this kind of doctrine go too far. You live in me, and I'll live in you. It'll be just like a vine and branches. You won't be able to tell where the juice starts, stops from one and enters the other. The Christ connection. Hallelujah. I am connected. John 15, verse 7. When you discover that Christ connection, I said that. Listen. Then you'll be able to ask what you will. You'll be done. Friends, that's the way it is. Hallelujah. Verse 11. This will bring joy. You bet. What makes me so happy? Three years after my darling wife went to heaven, me living a lonely life, miserable, 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 but happy. At peace. Happy. Happy. I'm connected. I'm connected. Are you hearing me? I'm connected. Believe it. Believe it. Hallelujah. You'll have my peace. And you live in uh, you live in me, and I'll live in you. Verse fifteen. 
John 15. Like a vine in its branches. You ask what you will. And it will be done. And this will bring joy that will be full and remain in you. You can't find me when I'm not happy. Hallelujah. I get up of a morning. It's so lonely in that house. I go out to fix me some breakfast. And I stop. I do this every morning. I look up and I shout hallelujah three times real loud. Just as loud as I can. I walk through the house, make a trip or two, praising the Lord. And then I go with the piano and I play three or four songs, just raise heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. And then go eat something and, and so forth. So on. Yeah. Joy remains in. Why can you be happy? You're happy because of some things that you know. I'm not just guessing at them. I know them. You know some more? He, he, says, he says, hey, look, he's not through. I'm still taking you. Uh, we're going to make it. <laughs> I'm still taking you on this little trip. Simple little idea to get people to understand. Hey, God wants to be in you. But that'll scare you. But look at me, Jesus. Sir. I'm just one with you. A carpenter. He's in me. He lives in me. I hear his word. I say it. He shows me what to do. He, I know what he wants to be done. I do it. Because it's him that works in me. I can't do anything by myself. He has life. I have life. Same kind of life. We're connected. You can have this. Follow me. I'll teach you how. It's easy. If you believe in me, the things I do, shall you do also. And all this is for everybody. I want you to catch on. God wants to be in you. He keeps getting warmer and warmer. Verse 14 of John chapter 15. John 15, 14. Remember, he said, with this joy in you, it'll be full. Remember, you are my friends. I love that. I love that. You're my friends. Look, it gets better. It gets better. Can it get better? You're my friends. I mean, hey, hey, Jesus is illustrating to you and me the friendship between us and God, the Christ connection. We're not alone. We're not nobodies. God counts on us. He needs us. We have flesh. He don't have any. We got something he hasn't got. We give it to him. He says a good deal. I'll give you my spirit and that'll be power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. Look, it gets better. Remember, you're my friends. Verse 14, 16. I've chosen you and ordained you that you go and experience all this good stuff. And whatever you ask in my Father's name, He'll give it to you. Then He prayed for it. He said, it's gotten so good. He said, I'm not going to last much longer. They're going to be killing me for it because they can't take this. He said, I want to pray for it. So He went alone and He prayed. John chapter 17. Oh, what a prayer. That was for me. And He said, now, Father, I have done what You told me to do. What a beautiful, beautiful uh, wrap-up. I've done what you told me to do. Can you say that? I can say that. You're saying that. Hallelujah. You're preparing. You're going to say that. You may not do it as big a scale as someone else. That's not the point. Someone came to me not long ago. What can I do? What can I do? I believe in it. I want to go. They tell me I shouldn't go. I'm not ready at all. I said, do it. Do it. Where? Where? Do it. To people. You mean just people around me? That's the point. Yeah. To people around me. I hadn't thought of that. I want to go to Africa. I want to go to India. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Do it, do it, do it. All around you. Do it, do it. Daisy said, Daisy said, cross your back fence and love your way to China. That's the idea. That's the idea. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? He, he's praying. I, Father, I've done what you told me to do. I have manifested your name to them. Oh, I've done that many times. Oh, boy, I've done that. I've stood on a platform. I've called over them and told them what I was going to do. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And the kingdom of hell trembles. Called. 
I've manifested your name. You can do that. There's still big stuff. Call. Seed power. Seed power. Say it. Teach it. It'll work. It'll grow. It won't quit. Hallelujah. Seed power. Believe. Even if you plant a seed, you don't get all frustrated and say, I'm not a good farmer. They tell me if you plant seed, it'll grow and you'll have a harvest. And I planted and planted and I, I dig it up. I, I plow it again and I plant again. No, come on. Seed power. Seed power. Seed power. Our ministry is all seed power. Pastor Doherty, how well you know that. You live the seed power. I've said to, I've said to, my, I've said to my daughter, it takes a life to build a church. It takes a life. It's taking your life to build this church. Christ builds his church, but I mean to serve as his instrument. It takes a life because the seed has to grow. And the seed has to grow in people as they will let it grow. And the faster they let it grow, the better. But you can't force growth. That's not the lesson. Listen. Listen. <laughs> Are you with me? How? They said, if you love me and keep my words, my Father will love you. We will come to you and make our abode with you. Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I've told you. He'll be there and teaching you, bringing it to your mind, and you'll have peace. John 15, you'll live in me. I'll live in you. You ask what you will, it'll be done. You'll have joy and it'll be full and remain in you because you're my friends. Remember that. I've chosen you and ordained you that you go and experience this. Father, 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 you've sent me to give eternal life to people. And real life is to really know you and the only true God and to know Jesus whom you've sent. Now that's quite a remarkable statement there. Don't miss that. When you're alone studying your Bible, pray for God to give you understanding. But Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking about himself. Jesus is saying, real life is to know you, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. God sent him to show us how he referred to himself. Verse 4, now I've done what you told me to do. Verse 6, I've manifested your name. Verse 8, I've given them your word. Verse 21, Father, you sent me, now I send them. Verse 21 more, my prayer is that they may be one like you are in me and I am in you. Verse 23, I in them and you in me. Have you noticed how many times he's come across that and said that again and again and again? You're smart. We don't have any dummies here. Why did he keep making that statement? I'm in you. You in me. The Christ man. The connection. The connection. We've got to live connected. The branch the, the vine, the branch must be connected to the branch. And it bears fruit. The deal, the system works if we're connected. We are connected. It's the Christ connection. He is our inspiration. Until the day he was taken up. I'm on page 9. I've got 23. Oh, and it's such good stuff. So verse 21, Father, you sent me, now I send them, that they may be one, as you are in me, and I am you. And then verse 23, I am them, you in me. Verse 26, that this love will be in them, and his last words, his last words, last words, and I in them. The Christ connection. Hallelujah. Then he changed roles. He was crucified. 
He paid for our sins. His blood was shed for us. He died for us. He rose from the dead. He called them and blessed them and said, Receive Holy Ghost power. Go. I'll be with you. The power came. And Jesus said, He'll testify of me. He'll not speak of himself. He'll receive of me and show it to you. He'll reveal it to you. And the message at Pentecost was Jesus. Read it. Jesus. Acts 2, 14 to 30. The whole focus is Jesus. Jesus. Especially underline verse 21, 23, 21, 31, 32, and 36. Did you get those? Verse 21, 31, 32, 36. The focus is on Jesus. That was Paul's focus. Galatians 1.15, it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. That's the great inspiration until the day he was taken up. And now that's the introduction to this study. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, but I'll put it in the book, the inspiration of his ideas, the inspiration of imitating him, the inspiration of impossibilities, the inspiration of how he saw people, the inspiration of how he saw religion, the inspiration of how he forgave people. This is my outline. There's the inspiration of how he healed the sick. The inspiration of how he paid for me. The inspiration of how he died and rose again. The inspiration of what he said about his own word. The inspiration about what he said about the world. The inspiration of his great commission. The inspiration of the harvest fields of the world. The inspiration of his words. The inspiration of his person. The inspiration of his ministry. Hallelujah. Our inspiration comes from our I, identity with him. I, illumination that he gives us. I, impartiality that he represents. I, importance of his mission. I, impossibilities that are eliminated. I, infallibility of his word. I, infusion of his Holy Spirit. I, integrity, we can trust him. I, the interpretation of God that he gives us, and I, the invitation that he gives us. And then there's still pages left. Hallelujah. That'd take a long time to get it all. God bless you. Would you stand? Hallelujah.